and welcome to Arcadia University's BI 327 Histology Lecture on Bone. In part three of this lecture series, we're going to take a look at bone growth. Now, when we take a look at bone growth, um, there are two generalizations that we need to keep in mind. The first is that there's going to be no interstitial growth. And so if we remember back to the cartilage lecture, the cartilage we said was going to be a relatively flexible matrix uh, and we had the ability to have interstitial growth. So we had the ability of uh, essentially isogenous groups being formed, uh, cartilage cells that are dividing and essentially growing from the inside of the, bone, uh, of the cartilage structure, pushing out at it, and so expanding the cartilage structure. Bone, because of the very hard inorganic matrix that's going to be present there, isn't going to be able to expand out. And so there's going to be no interstitial growth. So no growth from the inside of the bone structure itself. What we're going to have is only appositional growth. Appositional growth is going to be growth on surfaces. So we can look at growth on the external surface. Uh, if we've got a, a large opening within the marrow cavity, we can have growth along the internal surface, but it's always going to be allowed, uh, along a surface. So it's going to be depositing bone on top of an existing surface. Now, there are going to be two main types of bone growth. The first is going to be intramembranous ossification. And basically, with intramembranous ossification, what we're going to have is going to be the formation of bone in, in essence, condensations within the connective tissue. So we're going to have little clusters of cells. They're going to come together within the connective tissue. They're going to differentiate into bone-forming cells, and they're going to essentially form almost like little crystallization sites. They're going to form bone, and that bone is then going to be expanding out as these little regions, in essence, produce more and more bone. Now, intramembranous ossification is going to result in woven bone, that uh, immature form uh, of bone, in essence. Uh, the second type of bone formation we're going to look at is endochondrial ossification. Endochondrial, so we're essentially going to use a cartilage model and we're going to ossify it. We're going to add bone structure to it. And so we're essentially going to convert a cartilage model into a bone structure, into a bone model. Uh, bone model. So if we take a look at these, intramembrous ossification is essentially condensations of what are referred to as mesenchymal cells, but they're primitive connective tissue cells in essence. They're going to cluster around, they're going to clump together, and they're going to differentiate into osteoblasts. Osteoblasts, again, the, the bone builder cells. So we're going to have like little islands of bone that are going to be forming. And the osteoblasts, again, around the outside of this bone structure, again, appositional growth, growth along the surfaces, are going to be expanding out these little islands, expanding out these little clusters of bone. And as they come closer and closer to one another, they may merge with a surrounding island. They may merge with another region of bone. Uh, and they'll essentially fuse together to form our spongy bone, to form trabeculi and spicules, that open structure within the bone uh, formation. Locations where we'll find intramembranous bone ossification um, is the locations include uh, the flat bones, uh, contributes to the growth in the short bones, and it also contributes to the thickening uh, of the long bones as they're forming. Now, the second type of bone growth we're going to look at is endochondrial ossification. And now, endochondrial ossification means we're essentially going to have a cartilage structure and the properties associated with cartilage, and then over time, we're going to replace the cartilage with bone. And so we can see this uh, by converting the fetal uh, cartilage skeleton into a bone skeleton in childhood and adulthood. Uh, but extending into later stages of life, we can also see endochondrial ossification at the epiphyseal uh, growth plate. Uh, so it's either the epiphyseal plate, the epiphyseal growth plate, but essentially at the hyaline cartilage region, uh, the ends of long bones. And we're going to see that occurring through adolescence. And so if we take a look at this, again, keep in mind that we want to maintain cartilage on the articular surfaces of these bones. And so we want to maintain cartilage at the joint cavity. So no matter what we do, we don't want to convert all of the cartilage into a bone structure itself. 
And so what we're going to have is at the, the highest portion within the epiphyseal growth plate, closest to the joint cavity itself, closest to that articular cartilage that we talked about a little bit in uh, the cartilage lecture, is we're going to have reserve cartilage. And reserve cartilage is going to look like our generic hyaline cartilage. And that's going to be, in essence, the region that's going to protect our articular cartilage. And, but we want to maintain a reserve cartilage. And we're going to have this endochondrial ossification. We're going to have this conversion of cartilage uh, into bone. And so what we got to do is make sure we protect our reserve cartilage. And so underneath our zone of reserve cartilage, we're going to have a zone of proliferation. And what's going to happen within the zone of proliferation is we're going to have these cartilage cells dividing. And so in essence, these cells are going to line up in columns, or at least it's going to appear as if they're lined up in co columns uh, within the collagen matrix, within the cartilage matrix itself. Uh, and they're essentially going to divide. So you may see isogenous groups in this region, but you're going to see lots of cells that are going to be there because these cells are going to be dividing, and in essence, they're going to be going through that process of interstitial growth from within, interstitial cartilage production. So they're going to line up in the columns, have a strong proteoglycan matrix, so they might have a slight basophilic staining appearance uh, to the hyaline cartilage within this region. Now, what's going to happen then is we're going to be producing lots and lots of these cells, so lots and lots of cartilage, so that we continue to push back our reserve cartilage, push back our articular cartilage, push back so we maintain cartilage along uh, the joint cavity uh, region, the, the, the tips of the long bone. Now, some of these cells are going to be closer to where that bone formation is going to be going on. And so the cells that are closer to where the bone is being formed are going to be part of what's referred to as the zone of maturation. Now, in that zone of maturation, we're going to see that these cells are going to, in essence, mature. These cells are going to start to further differentiate. And one of the things they're going to do is they're going to undergo hypertrophy. They're going to get bigger, in essence. And when they get bigger, they're essentially going to be pushing against that cartilage matrix. Again, remember, cartilage is like a sponge. You can compress it, you can squeeze it, you can push on it, and it will respond to that to a certain level because you're essentially squeezing out some of the water in that region. So that zone of maturation is going to differentiate into the zone of hypertrophy and zone of calcification. And these are usually combined together. So we get hypertrophy, the cells get bigger, they're going to push against the matrix, and ultimately, they're going to, these cells, the cartilage cells, are going to be removed. Now, if we're pushing against the cartilage matrix, it's like we're squeezing the sponge. And you take the pressure off the sponge, the sponge is going to rebound, draw the water back in, and go back to its normal shape. So in this zone of hypertrophy, we can have these cartilage cells pushing against the matrix, forming larger lacunae, larger spaces. But if the cells go away, the cartilage is going to collapse back down. And so what's going to happen is, in the zone of hypertrophy and calcification, the cartilage cells are going to get larger, and then they're going to start to, cal to calcify the matrix. And so we got something weird going on here. What's going to happen is, we're essentially going to push against the cartilage, open up large spaces, and we're going to calcify it. And now the calcium is going to be doing something similar to what it does in bone, because it's going to make that cartilage matrix harder. It's going to make it more resistant. It's going to make it less resilient and less spongy in essence. And so that what happens is as these cells get larger, as they calcify the matrix, if they go away now, the matrix is going to stay in that point. We're going to leave an open space. And that's what happens is we essentially come up with this calcified cartilage, this weird stuff, and then the cartilage cells, the chondrocytes, are going to degenerate. So they're essentially going to break down. They become... Um, essentially gone. They're going to die. Uh, they're going to be lost. And then that calcified matrix, the lacunae of the calcified matrix, is going to be invaded by blood capillaries because we know that we're going to have to have capillaries with these bone cells because we can't have uh, diffusion occurring. And we're going to have osteogenic cells migrating into this region. And so these osteogenic cells, osteogenic, os for bone, genic for birth, are going to be involved with producing bone. Now, in the osteogenic zone, 
basically what's going to happen is that the cells are going to be producing the bone are going to come through and at least initially these osteoblasts are going to build along the existing surface so these osteoblasts are going to go through and they're going to form bone spicules they're essentially going to deposit bone again bone grows by appositional growth growth along a surface so the osteoblasts are going to build bone but they're going to build the bone on top of the calcified cartilage. So in this endochondrial ossification, at least initially, we're going to have cartilage, and that cartilage is going to become calcified, and then that calcified cartilage is going to be covered up with bone. And then later on, we're going to have osteoclasts and osteoblasts moving into this region, eroding away at this hybrid calcified cartilage bone conglomeration, removing it and then the osteoblasts behind it are going to come through and deposit true bone, bone on bone structures. And so we've got this process then that in endochondrial ossification, we're able to convert that cartilage model into a transitional model, a hybrid model, and then finally into a true structure of bone tissues. And that's what we're going to be seeing in the growth of these long bones. Now, we're going to see something similar when we take a look at bone fracture repair. Not um, as organized as what we have with endochondrial ossification, but we take a look at it. Uh, what happens then is we essentially break the bone, we disrupt the bone, uh, and in essence, we disrupt the filopodia, we may disrupt the blood vessels, we may disrupt uh, everything that's going on there because we're damaging the cells, we're damaging the blood vessels. So we're going to have a region of the bone matrix that's going to be broken down and destroyed. Uh, because the cells are going to be damaged, the cells are going to die because they don't have access to oxygen and nutrients. And so what happens then is macrophages, the same type of macrophages we've talked about before, are going to go through and, in essence, kind of clean up the damage. And then we're going to have progenitor cells that are going to be coming in. And they're essentially going to go through and replace, in essence, the scar tissue that's forming in that region. And it's going to be this kind of hybrid structure. It's going to be this interwoven structure. It's not going to be very organized, um, but it's essentially going to form this preliminary primary bone, uh, which is going to be referred to as a callus. It's going to fill in the gap. It's going to try to stabilize things. And then we're going to go through a process of bone remodeling. And so what's going to happen is we're going to have the same type of osteoclast breaking down the bone osteoblasts building the bone coming through and like that normal process of, of continual remodeling that's going to be occurring within the bone they're going to go through and they're going to replace the primary bone they're going to replace the callus with true secondary bone and that's where you're going to have a heel fracture where you've actually uh, kind of replaced the structure of the bone and ideally done it in a way that you're not going to see damage to the bone structure itself uh, uh, persistent damage or persistent uh, like fracture point that you can see. That's it for uh, that uh, portion of the lecture, and I lost my, my uh, intermediate slide. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. And as you can see from this, this preview, uh, come back for part four of this lecture where we're going to talk about uh, bone physiology.